remind you of a couple of things. If we have not met, my name is Chris Carson. I'm the pastor here at Riverside Presbyterian Church. And on behalf of the session, on behalf of the congregation, it is my, again, my privilege to welcome us as we gather. As we are gathering, and it's easy right now because it's easy to be a little bit distant, but if you want to, to ensure you are socially distanced, we have the, both of the side uh, areas to sit are spaced out uh, in COVID practices, so you're welcome to sit in either one of those places. If you have a bulletin, you will notice that we started something this month called Next Steps, where we gather together the first Sunday of every month during the Sunday school hour just to talk about who we are as a congregation and where we're headed. That would meet normally next week, but we're not going to have it next week. So we did it, in, we did it this month in September. We won't do it again until November. So if you were wanting to come to it next Sunday, um, you're welcome to come still. You'll just gather at that meeting by yourself. So strong chance you could have the meeting at home over coffee or whatever, but if you want to sit in a room and feel official, you are welcome to do so because the room is set aside for that meeting. We just won't have it next week. Next week, though, we will be having communion, and so I want to make sure that we are prepared for that. And if you are worshiping at home with us, I want to make sure you're aware of that as well. Next week, the first Sunday of the month, we'll be having communion. Make sure you have bread and juice at hand. Again, my privilege and my pleasure to welcome us as we gather together. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Join me, <clears throat> excuse me, join me in Psalm 96 for the call to worship. The Lord is with us. Whether our enemies attack, the floods rise, the waters rage, the Lord is with us. Blessed be the Lord, our help and our redeemer. Blessed be the Lord.
Part of the way we celebrate God's holiness and God's majesty is by turning to God and offering ourselves in confidence in prayer. We do so now in confession. That will take us into the Lord's Prayer and then a moment of silence to say anything else that needs to be said. Let's pray together. Merciful and loving God, our help and our strength. Grant that we might be free from the anxiety, the division, the doubt that stymies life. We long to serve freely, to walk in harmony, to live confident of your grace. But we are aware that we can't do these on our own. Let your grace wash over us, that the life we live might be worthy of you. In Jesus' name we pray as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's take a moment now in silence to say anything else that needs to be said. The Apostle Paul said this, he said, the proof of God's love is this, that he would send Jesus and offer Jesus so that all of us might know what it is to live fully into grace, fully into hope, and fully into life. The idea was that we would be confident and we'd be assured knowing that we are loved, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, called also to share those things with others. Know that we are a forgiven people because our God is a good and loving God. But let's not be still. There is work to be done. And all God's people said. Take a moment now to pass the peace to those around you. Again, we are doing this distance-wise. And as you are doing that, let me invite our youth down for our time together. All right, question is this, you ready? I feel like I'm echoing in louder today. The voice of God. All right, based on last week, what's your question? I gave you a week to think about it. You weren't here. You still need to know your, oh, you were back there. What's your question? I said, you didn't hear. Perhaps it was, Chris, I wasn't paying attention to you in that moment. The spirit was speaking to me and I was in prayer and meditation. That's what you meant to say, correct? Okay, that's what I thought. I, I was just helping you with that. All right, I asked you what your question was going to be. What's your question? Y'all are killing me. All right, just so you're aware, your fundamental go-to question next week, I'm going to ask you, do you have one or are you just messing around? All right, what's your question? Because you've been thinking about it. Well done, young child. Y'all take notes. Okay, and that is a perfect question today. I don't think that's the real question, but that's okay. If you had one food 
to eat for the rest of your life, what would it be? One food. No, dude, one food, not the whole store. Come on. One food, one item you could eat for the rest of your life. This was it. It was going to sustain you. It was going to, no, no, don't be helping your brother. Uh Uh-uh, don't be setting him up to get him in trouble. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh. One food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Chocolate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Wait, are you serious? Salad? You'd eat salad every day for the rest of your life? One food? Okay. Okay, so you want like the whole salad thing. You want the, like the egg in it, the cheese. You don't want just lettuce. Okay, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Are you serious? Pickles? Nasty. No, 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 it's not like okay. It's just one food. What would it be? You can't eat cake like that. Okay. You heard her. She cannot eat cake unless it comes from Publix. You heard that, right? I just want to make sure. Okay, you haven't had it. You haven't had it. Nope, that doesn't count. Okay, so I'm, I'm filling you with the cake thing, right? Because yesterday we had this sheet cake at our house. It's every bit of chocolate, every bit of good, but it's, it's really hard to make sometimes because if you cook it just a little bit too long, then it's kind of dry. Yeah, no good, no good. I mean, it's still pretty good because it's rich and chocolatey, but if you cook it a little bit too short, then it's soupy, right? Are you working for Publix now? Did they pay you before you came in? Said, I know y'all are on Facebook Live. Can you give us some love in a, in a commercial for Publix? Okay, so be thinking about it. If you had one food for the rest of your life and it sustained you, what would it be? And the reason I'm asking that is because in a little bit we're going to talk about food that sustains. And we're going to talk about types of food, but we're also going to talk about spirituality and things of that nature. So I want you to be thinking about that. What is it about that food that you like? And what would it be to share it with another person? Or to let another person share that, their food with you, right? Food that sustains. Next week, I'm going to ask you again, what's your question? Where's lunch is a good one. When's lunch is a good one today. <laughs> Do what? Okay, d- don't hurt yourself right now. We can come to it after worship, because we, ha- we do have other things to do this morning. So my question, yes, my question, well done, is formed as a question or as a statement. True. It could be a statement, but it depends on how I first. God, again, we just thank you for the chance to be together, to spend time with each other, to spend time with you, to talk about what it is to live as your people in your world. Be glorified in who we are and what we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Let's stand together and let's sing.
The gospel reading today is taken from Mark 6, 38 through 50. Listen to God's word. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. <clears throat> Excuse me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to, to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and than to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
also attest it is fall, or at least coming close to fall. In the church, that means, come on, people. Stewardship. If you've been in a mainline church once for a year in your life, you know come fall, what that means is we talk about stewardship. One of the things I think is really cool, just in my short time and the things that I have learned from y'all in our time together, is that we are one who takes seriously the idea of talking about stewardship in all of its forms all throughout the year. And so for us, it's not just a fall thing, and it's not just a money thing. It has to do with how we live and how we are and how we are with each other and how we are with our neighbors. And so in light of that, coming back to the question I was asking our youth, what is a food that sustains you? I want you thinking about that because we have two amazing mission partners that we are in partnership with. One is St. Vincent's and we bring food and we take it to St. Vincent's because they have a food pantry. Y'all know this, there is a, a shopping cart in the front of the church and there's one in the fellowship hall Every Sunday, people bring food, and they drop it off there, and magically, it just happens to get to St. Vincent's. For those of my generation and older, it's kind of like in the Jetsons, right? And we just put it on the thing, and we transport it through the air. It just happens. Okay, maybe that's not how it happens, but the other one is Children's Hunger Project. Children's Hunger Project is a ministry that reaches out to kids in Brevard, in, in our county, reaches out to our neighbors. And what, we are try, what they are trying to do is make sure the kids who are in need have food over the weekend, because many of these kids are on lunch programs. And so they sure enough have food, at least breakfast and lunch, Monday through Friday, but over the weekend they do not. And so we have reached out to them through our mission committee and said, we would love for a drive right now. If y'all could get together food, it would be great um, because we want to make sure we are able to feed all of those kids who are in need over the weekend. And so what happens is people bring food to Children's Hunger Project, they pack it, and then they distribute it to the schools, always in, in a bag. The bags are then put in the kids' Uh, backpacks and the kids take it home so that they have food to eat. It's a really cool thing. And the teachers who do this are amazing because they are able to take the food and put it in the backpack of the kids when the kids are at lunch or at recess or something like that. So no one really knows who is receiving food and who is not because there's stigma associated with that as well. So in the, in the, in the bags are 11 things of which I think we can get seven or eight of them very easily. Food allergies and all of those things will require us to work with Children's Hunger Project to get the others. And so I say that to you because for the next couple of weeks, we are going to be having a drive. And we're going to ask for a couple of things each week just to not overwhelm folks. One of the things we're asking for for next week is juice boxes. Everything has to be specific, so these have to be 100% juice, right? So not the, the ones that are not 100%. This is a pack of eight. Uh, it's Mott's. It says 100% juice. It says apple, white, and grape. Juicy juice is good for this as well. But it has to be 100% juice. Make sense? Okay. The other thing are these little Chef Boy RD uh, mini meals. These are specific because it can't be in the cans. It has to be these li little mini individual meals and make sure we send them to, uh, to Children's Hunger Project. So I just wanna make sure y'all get a chance to hold them and pass them back to each other to make sure you see them because they are specific. These are the ones that they need and they're a variety of He's a soccer player, so he wouldn't do the hand-eye coordination, doesn't, uh, doesn't work as much. Um, there's a variety of different kinds. Some are ravioli, some are beefaroni, but these are the ones they need. So this week, what the Mission Project is asking you to do is, if you are going to the grocery store, pick up some 100% juice boxes, bring them to church, 
little Chef Boyardee can, uh, containers, bring them to church, and we are going to begin collecting them, and we're going to transport them to Children's Hunger Project. I have this great dream and this vision that the entire front area will be full, and that the band and I and the liturgists will have to work around all of the stuff that we bring. Who knows if that comes to fruition, but that is a dream. And I hope, like you, I have a dream that one day organizations like the Children's Hunger Project will no longer be necessary. We're not there. They are needed, and it's my hope that we can help and we can stand with the children in our community. Let's pray. For this day and for this time and for this chance to be together as your people, to come into your place, to serve you in the various ways that we do, for the opportunity to offer ourselves to you in hope, in courage, in certainty of the ultimate end that you win. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the ways you are winning among us so that we might be able to do the same for others. Because we know in our world today there is pain, there is despair, there is confusion, there is hurt. And so if we are able, we ask that you would help us stand with others in ways that restore dignity and honor, but also provide insurance, provide hope, provide a chance to celebrate, a chance to, to be part of something bigger than themselves. Be with us in ways that bring others into your glory and to give light into your kingdom. Each time we gather together as your people, we thank you for the gift of your son. We try in so many different ways to put into words and the thoughts what it is to, to live in relationship with you, but we know it is indescribable that you truly are a God of wonders who does amazing, amazing things, and the best we can do sometimes is say, here we are. Do something with us, Lord. Lord of earth and sky and wind and rain, so that others might be able to make the same claim. And together, together we might walk places we can never walk alone. We ask in the time that we have this morning that you would speak to us. I'm not picky about how you do. Speak to us in ways that remind us again and again and again of who we are and of whose we are. In your name we pray. So from 1948, 1948 to 1975, I'm not going to ask you to do the math, I'll do it for you, roughly 30 years. 1948 to 1975, John Wooden was the basketball coach, men's basketball coach at UCLA. He is recognized by many as the greatest coach who has ever lived. That may or may not be true. What is sure enough true is that he is one of the most celebrated and he is one of the most decorated. He is a 10-time NCAA champion. His team won 10 championships in 12 years. At one stretch, they won seven years in a row. His teams won 88 consecutive games. Still the record in men's college basketball. I say men's because it's not the record in college basketball as a whole. There are two women's teams who have won more than 88. Y'all think about that for a minute. That's insane. 88 consecutive games. The UConn women did it twice. It is an incredible, incredible accomplishment. Amazing, amazing things. He is in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. He is one of four people who is in the Basketball Hall of Fame as a coach and as a player. And of the four people, he is the first one to accomplish that. Whether he was the greatest coach of all time or not, he is surely one of the most successful. One of his most successful recruits is a, a guy named Bill Walton. Many of you know him, and if you know him now, you know him as a crazy announcer who just talks on and on and on and on. But he is also recognized as one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived. At UCLA, he is a three-time player of the year. He is a two-time NCAA champion. He was the first pick 
in the NBA draft the year that he graduated college and was able to go pro. And he may have been one of Wooden's most successful and easiest recruits because he had dreamed of playing for Coach Wooden and at UCLA since he was 12. So all Coach Wooden had to do is say, we want you, will you come? Now, in his class, in his class, freshman class at UCLA, all of his class were all Americans. They were some of the best players in the country at the time. They could have gone anywhere, but they went to UCLA because they wanted to play for Coach Wooden. At the time, freshmen could not play on the varsity, but they were excited to be there. They were excited to learn. They were excited to be part of this big, huge juggernaut that Coach Wooden and UCLA had created. At the time that he entered as a freshman, UCLA was going for its, I want to make sure I get this right, fifth straight national championship. It's sixth in seven years. This was a machine that he was entering and he was part of. Again, everyone in his class, all Americans, everyone in his class pretty much could have gone anywhere. All of them excited just to be together and to be playing at UCLA and to be playing for Coach Wooden. Bill Walton tells the story of the first day they had practice his freshman year. All of them, again, excited to be there, pumped to hear from Coach Wooden, pumped to hear what he's going to say, eager just to, to get these nuggets and nuggets of wisdom and to play basketball under him and to blossom as basketball players. And so he gathers them together, all of these All-Americans. They are in the locker room, 18, 19-year-old men, and the first thing he does is teaches them how to lace their shoes. And then he teaches them how to put their socks on. A specific way. They must be done this way so as not to get blisters. And then once he's taught them how to lace their shoes, Again, all Americans, 18, 19-year-old men who have laced their shoes before and probably once or twice in their lives put socks on. Then he taught them how to slide their socked feet in their shoes so the socks didn't move and they didn't get blisters. Walton says, it was like a joke. We couldn't believe we had been waiting all of our lives to sit and, and, and be in front of him and be in his presence and absorb all of his wisdom. And he's teaching us how to lace our shoes and to put our shoes and our socks on. He said, and to make it worse, Coach Wooden at that time was kind of old and he demonstrated on himself first and he had these mangled feet. So here we were, 18, 19 year old men watching this disgusting thing the last thing we expected to see and hear from him. But the point was this. If you master the basics, everything else takes care of itself. If you master the basics, everything else takes care of itself. The author of James, from whom we're going to read in just a minute, the author of James, who we think was Jesus' brother, would have said the exact same thing. Before we go to our passage, though, let's talk for a minute about James. James in the Bible is in the New Testament. It's towards the back. It's pretty small. It's hard to find if you're opening the book. I don't know what page it's on in the, in the books of the pews. But if you get to Revelation, just go back to the left a little bit, and you'll find it. It is small. It is a letter. It is called one of the Catholic letters. And when we talk, and I think we've talked about Catholic letters, but if not, I'm gonna, we're going to do it again. Catholic, in this case, is lowercase c, not uppercase c. So you think about the word being spelled out. If it's an uppercase c, it's for the Roman Catholic Church, right? That kind of Catholic. When it's lowercase c, it means universal. So James is one of seven letters in the New Testament that is Catholic, lowercase c. It is a universal letter. And what that means is this. It was written to the church. It was written to Christianity, to people of faith as a whole, as opposed to the other letters, most of them from Paul, that were written to specific communities. You feeling me? Corinthians, for example, was written to the church in Corinth. Thessalonians to the church in Thessalonica. Philippians to the church in Philippi. Galatians to the church in... James was not written to any specific audience other than the church. To all of us, 
and all of those who have come before us, and God willing, all of those who will come after us. Now, the audience that we think James had in mind were former Jews, now Christians, who were dispersed throughout the land outside of Israel. And so they don't necessarily have a place to gather. They don't necessarily have a community to lead them and show them how to be people of faith. What they have is this great, wonderful heritage that is part of our heritage too, but they don't know how to take the next step. And so in many ways, James is a how-to letter. Here are the basics. Here are the things that sustain. Here are the things you need to know. Here is what it is to be a Christian. It's essentially being a Christian for dummies before that series came out right? I mean, y'all have seen the Four Dummy series. This is really what the book of James is. Now, again, a how-to, step-by-step, here is the process. It's a small letter, so it kind of leaves out a whole bunch of stuff. But the idea is, if you get this, you've got it. Think about it from your standpoint. As a person of faith, if you wanted to make sure something got this. Make sure you understand this about faith. Make sure you're able to grasp this concept. What would it be? And that's what James is wrestling with. He wants his readers, he wants his people to get this. And so there's urgency because he knows it's important and he knows it'll help them move closer and closer to God and closer and closer to each other and closer and closer to their faith. As we read, there's a little more urgency because he's coming to the end of of the letter. So he's got to sum it all up again, right? And and always, most of the time, at the end of the letter, the last words are the words that are important. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, and they go like this. Who is wise and who is understanding among you? Show by... I don't know that that is right. So, again, according to James, if you're going to get something, make sure you get this. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any are you among you cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of our Lord. The idea again, if you do anything, this is what you need to do. It seems a little too simple. It's been 2,000 years. Surely there's more to it than that. And so it's easy to blow over, right? Because what we know, and we know it from experience, is suffering is not always, and in fact is rarely cured by prayer. We've had suffering in our lives. We've had suffering in our people's lives. We've had suffering in our loved ones' lives. And we have prayed. And we have prayed hard. And the prayers, at least as we offered them, were not always answered. What we know is that if you are sick, anointing doesn't always, in fact, it rarely heals. Sometimes medicine will do the trick. Sometimes time will do the trick. Rarely does anointing do the trick. And so it is important for us 2,000 years later to realize that for James and our ancient brothers and sisters, the concept of community of faith and faith was different. They didn't talk about individual faith much like we do. It wasn't, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you said the prayer and are you in the club? And it wasn't, hey, go pray and before you go to bed, get down on your knees and by yourself and offer up these words. 
that kind of theology and that kind of spiritual practice never entered their minds. It was all about a communal thing. Are you part of the tribe? Are you in the family? Not have you said some a prayer, but, but are we living and are we in this together? And so the idea was, are you sick and are you suffering? Well, don't do it by yourself. Go get those people who love you and who will support you and who will care for you and let them know what is happening in your lives and let them, let them be with you during that process. Let them stand with you in that process. Humble yourselves, invite them in in that moment and let them walk with you until you can walk on your own. We get this. We understand this. It's why we're talking about bringing food and drink to church. Because we know that there are people in our community, and they may not be in our individual family, but they are in the human family, and they are in need. And it is our call as people of faith to be for them and to be with them. And one of the ways we do that is by making sure their basic needs are met. But it extends beyond that as well. Every Wednesday, we have a faithful group who gathers together, and they take all of the prayer concerns in the church, and they pray earnestly and hard over every single name. Whether those people are part of the church or not, they are connected to the church, and we are connected together as children of God and as people of God, and so they are part of who we are together, and people gather every week and pray on their behalf. It's why when someone has had a baby, we say to them, hey, can I come hold your baby? But the way I say it is, can I bring you some food? Because we know new parents have a lot going on and they don't have time to eat and cook and do all of those things, but also because we want to hold their baby. It's why when someone has got family in the hospital, we make casseroles and we say, you can freeze it, or you can eat it right now. The idea is, whenever it is time and you are need, if there's anything that I can do to walk with you through the process. Faith at its best, in our practices, throughout all time, is not an individual thing. It is always a corporate thing. And that's true whether we are singing songs of praise. The goal is not to brag, but it's to let people in our bodies know life is good, and let me tell you why it is good. I just passed this test. My kid just did this. I've just made this team. I've just accomplished this. I finally can breathe again. The idea is we as a body, just as we want to hold each other in those times that we need to be held, we want to celebrate and throw a party in those times when things are going right. The goal is not to be individual monks or set apart by ourselves. The goal is to be with and for others. And so if you are sick and you are suffering, James says, go pray. But he's not saying go off and pray by yourself. He's saying go gather people around you and be part of something bigger than yourself. If things are going well, go invite others into your celebration so they might celebrate with you. They might experience some of your joy and live into the goodness that is happening in your life. The goal, the call, is to be with and for others. It has been 2,000 years, give or take, since James wrote. And the world has changed drastically in that time. But what has not changed is the call. There is a French theologian, his name is Michel de Certeau. Close. And what he said is this. The most fundamental form of Christian practice the most fundamental form of, if you get nothing else, he says, get this, is to make space for the other. The most fundamental form of Christian practice is to make space 
for the other. I'm pretty clear James would agree. I hope we do too. Let's pray. Here we are in this place that is yours, in this place that we claim, in this place that we take up space. And we ask, Lord, that you would let us be in such a way that there is always space for our brother, always space for our sister, always space for those that you put in our lives, no matter how long they are there, so that together we might celebrate the bonds that unite us in one, in your name, in your hope, and in your love. Let us live and let us be in ways that remind folks they are never alone. In your name we pray. We'll stand together. Let's sing.
my privilege and my pleasure to welcome us. It is also my privilege and my pleasure to send us out as a people. Let us go in peace. Let us go in hope. Let us go in love. Let us go in courage. Let us go committed to standing with those we encounter so that everyone we encounter would know something of God's love and God's grace. And all God's people said. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it far. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by. Shall meet on that beautiful shore. We will sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirits will sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet. By and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise and the glorious gifts of His love and the blessings to hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore 